chapter of the book of Romans, getting close to the very end of the book. And Paul has taken us on quite a journey. Uh, there are no theological things that he has not taught us. And I want you to remember that this was a letter, as we pointed out last week, this was a letter that was directed to a group of people, churches, in Rome. And this group of churches in Rome were strong. At least a lot of them were. But they had issues and they had problems just like all churches have. Paul wrote this letter not to inform them about all the great theological issues. They knew all the they knew everything anyway. They, they'd been taught well. But as a reminder that they had to keep the faith. They had to keep going. And last week we looked at a lot of folk <laughs> that he wrote and said he was basically saying hi, howdy to, and he made some comments about it. We, we spoke about some of the things that make, uh, that make the people of a church. But Paul's actually bearing down a little bit stronger here with telling these people what they, they need to kind of watch out for. And I think that would be great advice for all of our churches even today. So let's look in Romans the 16th chapter, verses 17 through 20. We'll be talking about the visitedness being divisive and evil. And how they are always a threat to a local church. If you've ever been part of a church that has had divisive people in it, or they've had, well, yeah, evil people in it. Have you, have you ever seen that in a church? Yeah. The reason can simply be stated, people have problems. If you're here today and you have no problems whatsoever in this world, in this life, then I'm going to, I'm probably going to call you a liar first and then if you convince me, I'm going to figure out how you've done it. Okay? <clears throat> Even believers, children of God, have problems. And sometimes they take those problems into the church building with them. Sometimes they take their problems out on the church and its people. The fact that we live in a corrupt and a depraved world means that people become disgruntled, they become disappointed, they become unhappy, become selfish, they become sinful, and in some cases they can actually become evil. Even the strongest of believers can, uh, can become contaminated with this corruption by having just to live in the very air of this world. It's because of this that Paul warns the church and its believers to mark the visit people. When we say mark, we don't, you don't take a magic marker and put anything on your head. It's not that kind of... To recognize... You don't have to do anything about it, but you can say, you've got to watch out for that person. And that's what he's talking about when he's talking about marking. So he begins in verse 17. That you all may welcome her in the Lord, worthy of the saints. That's not it. Okay. You should start out with, now I'm calling <laughs> See if that's on there anywhere, is it? Uh, no. All right. All right, we'll catch it. Now I am calling you all brothers to be watching out for those causing the dissensions and stumbling blocks contrary to the teaching which you all did learn and you all be turning away from them. For such, they are not serving the Lord our Christ. But out of their own desires and through the smooth talk and flattery, they are deceiving the hearts of the innocent ones. This warning 
Remember that list that we went through last week? 30 people that we talked about that he was saying hello to? These people, he gives that list and all of a sudden he cuts into this. Not all the people in those Roman church were good people. There were people who were creating problems. And he's issuing this as a severe warning. And it's not an afterthought. It's an exhortation. You know, needed by a strong church. I, I want to clarify something. A strong church does not mean you have a lot of people showing up for services. Strong church doesn't mean that you have this big fancy building. Strong church does not mean you have a lot of money to buy. A strong church doesn't mean that you have a charismatic preacher or all this fantastic music that people try to go to. A strong church is reality each, how strong each and every member is of that church. That's what makes a strong church, not of the other things. And it's inevitable. No matter how we may strive and you know may strive to keep the church, I've heard too many times, pure, you know, to keep the church from evil seeping in, evil seeps in. No matter what you do. And you know why evil seeps, seeps, uh, seeps in? Because people show up. <laughs> That's it. And you say, well, that never happened to me. Yes, it could. Um, a, div a divisive person is a person who grumbles, complains, they're argumentative, unloving, gossips, causes strife. And the big one here Paul was actually talking about is teaching heresy, which is the whole reason why he wrote the book of Romans is the lay down exactly what was truth and what was heresy. So they can point to Paul's writings, which was and, and still is the Word of God, and say, no, they're wrong. The most effective way for Satan to get a foothold into a, into a church is to quietly, insidiously move an evil person or a more divisive person in some teaching or leadership position where he can influence immature Christians. They're very smart people lots of times, but they'll end up teaching heresy. Paul knew this. So he left this warning to the end of the letter. And I know this last chapter doesn't seem like it has a whole lot of theology and it doesn't have a lot of relevance, but it really does. The raw churches at Rome were not much different than our churches even today. All the buildings obviously didn't have buildings. We have buildings. They probably didn't have a worship service such as we have. They, they certainly didn't have uh, Facebook Live. <laughs> you know, so, but, but the reality is the same. The people who attended those services are the same kind of people that attend this service. And services all over the all over the place right now. It's a warning here that he gives it must be heeded by a strong church if it's going to be a witness for the Lord. The word division means standing apart, causing a separation. And the word offense means laying a stumbling block in someone's way or causing someone to fall. As a kid, I hope you hadn't done this as an adult, but as a kid, you ever trip somebody on purpose? Causing them to fall? You can be a stumbling block by causing someone to fall, and that's an offense against that person. There's been a lot of preachers, a lot of deacons, a lot of church members, a lot of Sunday school teachers throughout the history of Christianity who have caused people to stumble, to offend. You see, the divisive person 
acts contrary to the doctrine which believers have learned. The doctrine of God and of Christ is simply stated in 1 John, the second chapter, verse 13. And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave commandment. That is what we have to know. That is what we have to abide by. We have caused so many people to stumble because we've added to this so greatly, just as the Pharisees had. Once again, Paul is making, saying, watch out for these people who are going to turn you away from anything to, uh, towards legalism. Genuine believers are the ones who have trusted God's Son, that accepted Christ their Savior, giving all they are and all they have to Him. And they do love one another, having committed their lives to carry the doctrine of Christ to the world. Randy and I were just kidding up here trying to get you off on the back to your pews. Count Daddy doesn't run off. We kind of looked at each other and said we could have worse problems. A lot worse problems. You could have been sitting in your chairs, your seats, and never said a word to your neighbor. You see, genuine believers are ones who follow this, this verse. To believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another. However, this isn't true with a divisive person. He acts contrary to the teaching of Christ and of God. You, can, you notice after a while, you, you may sound that the outside may seem fine, but you notice they're hateful to somebody. You notice they get upset when somebody disagrees with them or somebody calls them on their heresy. He opposes the Lordship of Christ. A person who thinks they know it all and never gives it to God and entrust their life with Him and say, no, God knows it all. Please tell me the truth. So, they, they oppose the Lordship of Christ. They oppose the doctrine of Christ. And what is the doctrine of Christ? Believe on the name of, of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. Those are the two doctrines of Christ and the love of believers. The love of believers. However, this is not true with a divisive person. And no matter how they may try to blend in, no matter how they try to, try to hide the fact, they always end up doing it. You can always tell that they love the division. They love the, they love the confusion that they cause. So he's telling them to avoid them because of the terrible devastation that a divisive person can do to the strength of a church. We're not talking, you know, anything. We're not talking kicking them out of church, but it can lead to that if it continues. But it certainly means that you're not to give them credence. The word avoid means to shun, to turn away from, to keep away from, to remove oneself from. If you're hanging around somebody who's, or hanging around someone who's uh, all the time talking heresy, all the time is hateful, mean, and they profess to be a Christian, guess what? You don't need to hang around that person. Doesn't mean you hate them. As a matter of fact, you should love them, you should pray for them. But just don't hang around them. There's nothing good that's going to come out of that. Keep an eye on them. Watch them closely. And so, this is essential to God's purpose for the church. Truth without unity. Truth, well, get this. Truth without unity leads to pride. I have the truth, but no one else does. I have the truth. That's pride. Look, there have been so many things over the last 60 
years of my life that I thought one thing, believed one thing, and then I found out that I was wrong. I'm not going to list them for you. <laughs> it would take too long. But I, you know, I truly believed something, and then I found out the truth. And guess what? When you're confronted with the truth from what you believe, guess what you need to go with? You need to go with the truth. Swallow your pride. Truth without unity leads to pride. Unity without truth leads to pride, leads to a departure from the true gospel itself. You know, if you believe that you can lose your salvation by sinning, if you believe that, you say, I just can't understand. It. I, I, you know, God not worthy of entering, of being with God, of Him saving me. Well, it's not about what you think. It's about what God's Word says. Okay? Each of these must be guarded against. So a divisive person does not serve Christ in essence, but he serves his own desires. We have had so many people come through the, the, the front doors of a church over probably since this was written. And they'll come through and they use it as their own little power, a, a place of power, trying to maneuver and, 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 and basically gain power where they can't get power in the, in the real world. We've seen people come in and manipulate, try to manipulate churches. We've actually seen people who try to come in and take from churches. I, I, they're not doing it to serve Christ. They're doing it for their own personal advantage. The Word, the script, the, clearly Scripture teaches that divisive persons do not serve Christ. They, they can call themselves Christians, but their Lord is not Christ. They are not committed to His honor and glory. They're not committed to His mission, but to themselves, to get Him and doing what they want. The divisive person is still given over to the things of the carnal, the sensual, and secular world. That's the problem. Is when we walk through the doors to worship together and beyond, it should be all about Christ and not what we want, not what we desire. When someone walks away from a church and says, I'm just not getting what I need here. My suggestion to them is they're not giving what they need to give. And deceivers and dividers, you see, they never want to appear to be selfish. Typically, they perceive themselves as crusaders for a noble cause. I'm doing this for Christ. He's going to tear the entire church up for the cause of Christ because of what they believe is right. No, you don't tear churches up on a quest uh, for, the, for, for God. You ever wonder why in business meetings, fortunately not here, it's been a long time since we've had a to visit business meeting, but you ever wonder why there's always two, three, or four different people of different opinions and they're fighting with each other about what they want and they all, every one of them is claiming, I believe, I prayed about it and I believe this is what God wants. <clears throat> the math don't add up. God does not have divided opinion. So somebody's wrong. It's because of pride. It's because of pride. We don't want to see the truth. He also says... A divisive person uses talk and flattery words. Use car sales. <laughs> he uses smooth and persuasive and plausible words, things that are sound right, to lead people to take sides with him. Look, been there, done that, and I hope we will never do be there again, but I, you know. If you're making phone calls outside of church to try to get, you know, to try to persuade people to be to get on your side of an issue in the church, it, this is a problem. Yeah. Obviously, you can talk, but uh, there are people 
who have actually destroyed churches, not just churches, organizations, other secular organizations, but destroyed churches by simply talking people in to being on their side of an issue. And then when business meeting rolls around, they, they said, I've got this, you know, people behind me. He acts, he, but he talks, and he acts godly, and he shows interest and concern for those who want to convince. I was told when you go to a new church as a pastor, watch out for that first person who treats you really, really nice. Yeah. <laughs> Beware of that person who's offering to give you things. And he, but know what Scripture says, that the motive of the divisive person is not to help that person, but to deceive. He wants others to think as he thinks, to believe as he believes, to walk as he walks, to live as he lives, to follow as he follows, to talk as he talks, but he doesn't want them to walk as God wants them to walk. He doesn't want them to talk as God wants them to talk. <clears throat> That's because his concern is getting people to be on his side. It happens, guys. And before you know it, you've got churches that are split, divided, simply because you've got one person who won't let one issue go and decides to go around to everybody else to do that. Paul says, watch out for these people. As Barney Fife would say, nip it. <laughs> nip it in the bud. If we had a lot of young people here, they wouldn't have a clue what I was talking about. <laughs> He deceives the simple. Now, that word when I was translating it, it, it it's not, you're not stupid. Uh, it just means the unsuspecting, the innocent, the immature, the carnal, the newborn believers, those who don't really know, uh, ignorant, and they're looking to someone to help them understand what Scripture is saying or how to act as a Christian. And if they get tutored by the wrong person, they can go down a wrong path quick. Let's look at verse 19 and 20. For your obedience did reach to all people. Therefore to you all I am rejoicing. But I am desiring you all <coughs> to be wise concerning the good things and innocent concerning the evil things. And the God of peace will crush Satan under his feet shortly. <clears throat> Our strong church, such as the Roman church, must constantly be marking and focusing upon what is good and untainted with evil. And if a strong church fails to know and do good, it will be penetrated by evil, this, this business, and it will become a weak church. Where everything is permissible and everything is okay. Therefore, a strong church must always, with the utmost diligence, be looking for what is good and untainted with evil. And there are three reasons why Paul gives this charge. The first is a strong church, like the Roman church here, is obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the reason for its strength. The church has been obedient to the Lord. They've been doing exactly as He commands. They've been, you say, well, what is the command? Well, living soberly, righteously, godly in, his, in this present world. They've been ministering to the needs of people even as He ministered. They've been witnessing far and wide to everyone, fulfilling His mission. The lack of such a dynamic obedience the result, I'm sorry, of it is a strong testimony that's spread to all men. They'll look at those, those people there at that church and they'll say, those are some good people. And they actually believe, they act upon what they say they believe. A strong church must be wise to know what is good. There are lots of things, Paul says there are lots of things that's permissible. But not all things are good for you. I mean, 
There's some things on this diet that I fell off of quite a bit. <laughs> Too much Mexican food. But on that diet, there are things that, you know, you know, I can eat I can eat anything I want to. There's nobody stopping me. Miss Terry can't even stop me from eating all this stuff. But is it good for me? No. It's not. So it's not a matter of uh, there are just things that are not good for a person, for a group of believers to do. Don't bring it upon yourselves and don't bring it into the church. <clears throat> it's people must grow more and more in goodness in knowing what is good and what is evil. There should be no doubt about something. In, really, there should be no doubt of any of us in here about what's good and what's evil. You should know that. Now, it doesn't mean you're not going to do it, the evil. We end up doing it every once in a while. But if we're going to know the difference. We're going to know what is good and we're going to know what is evil. If believers must be wise to search for what is good and untainted with evil. To know what is good. And the those questionable things that you're going, hmm, I wonder. Let me put it like this. If you have to ask the question, you probably don't need to do it. Okay? The way to keep evil out of a church is to focus upon the good. The way to demonstrate spiritual wisdom is to concentrate upon the good. Paul says in Philippians, upon these things think of. And he lists all these great, wonderful, positive things. Yeah, I know that sounds like a new age thing, doesn't it, Dan? <clears throat> but it's true. You think of those things, you start doing those things, but if you think of evil things, guess what you're going to end up doing? The evil things. <clears throat> Once you think about the evil, the good things, you'll begin to recognize the evil things and reject the evil things. And a strong church must not only avoid evil, it must not allow evil to pen penetrate its fellowship. You, must, you cannot let you cannot let a divisive person just stir up the simple, unsuspecting, the innocent believers of the church. So a church must be wise. And if you have a troublemaker, they need to be addressed. That problem needs to be addressed. It must be wise enough to spot the evil and stop its penetration into the fellowship. He specifically is dealing with the issue of false, uh, false doctrine. But it really applies in all other aspects too. You know, I can't... If Dan starts teaching... If Dan starts teaching that we can lose our salvation. Even in, even in you know, in an undercurrent, you know, just saying there's possible and all that stuff. I have an obligation, as well as all of us, to stand and say, Dan, you can't teach no more. That's the obligation. If I got up and I began to preach <laughs> baptism, regener baptismal regeneration, in other words, you have to be you know, baptized to be saved, guess what? I expect every single one of you to stand up. You get out of that pulpit. You'd be puzzled because I, you know, <laughs> why I would do it. But no, I, I, would be, I would be wrong. Or even if I started going around and I began to talk to people and say, guess what? I don't really believe once saved, I always saved you. Let me show you why. And if I started doing that, we need to root out that evil. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> so, the idea here in this last phrase, and the God of peace will crush Satan under his feet shortly. Now look, there's two ways of looking at this. Is it talking about time? Well, we know in Scripture, time doesn't mean the same thing that we think. I think we're going to, well, it's kind of like when 
I tell my wife that I'm going to take the trash out shortly. My idea of shortly is a little bit different than hers. You know? I told you I'd get around to it. Quit reminding me every three months. So this idea about shortly is kind of strange. Uh, is that he's the idea is not that God is coming soon to destroy Satan, but actually, I've struggled with this, but I'd probably now put, instead of shortly, I'd put quickly. I think that probably is a better, and if I remind myself, I'll change it. But quickly. In other words, he'll be quickly defeated. It ain't going to take long. <clears throat> His work against God's consecrated people, a, a strong church, will only last for a moment. The God of peace will restore peace swiftly and quickly to the fellowship of a strong people. It can be changed. A weak can church with all kinds of issues and, and uh, people who are evil or people who are divisive. It can be, it can, God can quickly bring peace by crushing Satan under his feet. Is he talking about end time? Is he talking about something that's going to happen in the future? Or is he talking about something that's going to happen in the church? And the answer is yes. He is the God of peace. I want you to notice something though. The defeat of Satan and to visit persons is, con is conditional. A strong church must do what's been said. You need to mark and focus upon what is good and what is untainted with evil. You see, God is going to bruise Satan under the believer's feet. And it is the feet of the believers that God uses to prove Satan. I don't care, dear, if you got problems in a church. You can pray all you want to. And prayer works. But he is going to use the people of that church to defeat the problems of that church. He is not going to mystically and magically just, all right, you want peace? And you're going to sprinkle peace fairy dust on us and everything's going to be all right. He's going to use us. And which means we've got to be wise. Which means we've got to be aware. We've got to start marking the potential problems and take care of them before they infest the church. And the God of peace will crush Satan under his feet quickly, shortly. We don't have to let Satan destroy our churches. With the power of prayer, recognizing Satan's there, things can change. God can make things, the God of peace can make peace within churches. I can honestly say, I, I, I truly believe that we've seen this happen here over the, over the past. I don't think that we have that issue there unless Randy or Aaron's been really teaching something heretical. I'm, I haven't heard anything yet, so. <laughs> or, or maybe the phone the phone's getting ate up talking bad about the preacher. I haven't heard that yet, and I probably won't, but I use, you can usually see the results of it. And I think that we've tried to focus upon the good. So, I come back around where we started. What's a strong church? A strong church is one that looks to Christ for the truth and for its path. A strong church is one that recognizes evil when they see it and has nothing to do with it. 
A strong church is full of strong members who know the Lord, believe in Him, trust Him, and understand that when there's differences of opinion, they all go to the Lord and they see what the Lord wants. And it'll be amazing how the God of peace will crush Satan and his plans when we do that. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in here that we need to take to our hearts. Principles that's not just for church, but for anything in our families, in our workplace. Principles of, of you know, letting God make the decisions and not us. Principles about how we are to address and deal with divisive people. How we are to deal with evil people. Not to let them into our, not only our church, but to let them into our lives. Pray for them. That God will change them. That God will save them. But don't let it permeate in our lives. That's what people in the trauma of church. And you see, the thing about why is it important to be a strong church? What well, he said it earlier. Being witnesses. Witnesses of what? Well, we'll talk about more about that next week, but he's going to make a big plea about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because really, since the very first chapter to the very end, it's everything has been about the good news of Christ. And when you think about it, we need to really protect that good news. We need to not only protect it, but we need to spread it. We need to tell everybody. And you know what? If I'm a proven liar, if I say one thing and do another, you're not going to believe anything else I say. And that's the important part. That we are strong in obedience to the Lord. That we are strong in the fact that we recognize good and evil. And not do evil. To root it out. And to protect the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul spent this whole book talking about that. He wanted to make it perfectly clear about what it is. Matter of fact, he made it so clear that he wrote what we call the what we call the Roman road. <laughs> For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the penalty, the, the, the cost of, of that is death. And how, because of what He did on the cross of Calvary, He took upon the sins of us on the cross. He made a sacrifice. He even spelled it out for us about how to get there. Call upon the name of the Lord thy God and be saved. Thou shalt be saved. So you see, those Tense, those things is what he was talking about we absolutely need to protect. And we have to be a strong church in order to protect that gospel of Jesus Christ. So as we stand and we prepare for an invitation, I don't know your heart, don't know your life. But I'll tell you this. If you've not, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've never trusted and believed in Him. And right now, the Spirit of God is dealing with your heart and in, with your life. Saying, you need to come to Me. You're lost. And that guilt of sin is building up. And the Spirit of God is addressing it. You can just wipe it all clean if you just accept it. Believe and trust in Me. This is the opportunity for you to do that right now. And it's my prayer that you will. And as we sing, would you talk to God about it? And you say, Brother Randy, I've already done, been there, done that. That's fine. But what is He talking to you about? What is it when you allow Him to speak to your heart? What is it? What, can I make a suggestion to you? Whatever it is that He's bothering you with, would you just say yes so He'll leave you alone? <laughs> just say yes. 
Because He's never going to lead you someplace that's going to hurt you. He's never going to lead you someplace that's going to cause you to do evil. He's never going to lead you someplace that will make you go to hell. So listen to Him. Just say yes. As we see. Number 560. 560. 